Good afternoon. Uh, we uh, resume our uh, talk here and we are still at the initial uh, stage of this uh, series of lectures. The uh, one that I am going to be discussing right now will continue with uh, some of the tools and techniques which are uh, pretty common and we will uh, just about reach the uh, we will touch 6 sigma, we will just make a beginning of 6 sigma as we go into this. You would remember when we uh, started uh, when you stopped the lecture in the previous uh, session, session 2, we discussed how to take customer requirements and how to convert them into specification. That was something that we could do quite easily by asking people some questions and by asking our staff how are we going to be solving them. So, we converted the what is the customer, what is it that the customer wants and how are you going to be satisfying that. Now, the same process can continue as you go deeper into the process. For example, when I am doing product planning, I would take direct requirements of the customers and I will come up with design requirements. That is something I could do by going through this process of doing product planning. When I come to product design, I will look at design requirements and I will come back with specification parts and the item characteristics. When I am doing process planning, which is the place where these parts are converted into the real process, into the real product. There of course, we will be doing again one other layer of QFD and we will be taking parts and input characteristics, item characteristics as the input and uh, putting through the process planning stage, we will convert them into process operations, the specifications for the process. Once that is known to me, then I will bring in process control logic and I will try to come up with operations requirements. So, starting with customer requirements, I come all the way down to what am I going to be doing on the floor. That is like and at every phase I have used QFD, that is what I have done. Cost of mismanaging, of course, you know we have already mentioned that there is going to be a lot of rework and returns for the customers, which is going to add up to failures and loss of profit and so on. That is something that we would like to avoid. Commitment to quality is quite easy to detect. And if you look at these uh, points here, problems are corrected very quickly with suppliers, equipment faults are faults are put to, put right by improved maintenance people as quickly as possible. People are well trained, partnerships are built with suppliers and also with customers We understand both sides of the story. Continuous improvement is observable. If you go back to the same factory with some gap, a gap of like, like a month, you will see some change there. And the sure, sure fire way of saying that something is, something good is happening in the company is when business begins to grow, you get more orders. Some distinctions again, TQM as I mentioned to you, it is not a program, it is a culture, it is a way of thinking. ISO 9000 is a set of guidelines basically to impact all quality, quality, quality related activities. Uh, these impact your practices and put your house in order. That is what is done in ISO 9000. Six Sigma is a technique oriented approach. It is very heavy on techniques and results. It is a business process. It is a process that impacts your business, that impacts your process and produces better results. Competitive positioning, how you want to compete. There are some tips given here. Do you want to be the lowest price supplier? And uh, do you want to target the market in a broad way or a, do you want to go after a niche market? And do you do that by assessing your buyers, suppliers, competition and so on and so forth? These are different, for a few different things that you must do right in the beginning. Then you determine how you are going, you are going to be adding value to this in this chain, how you are going to be doing it. If you just look at TQM, TQM also starts by identifying the needs and expectations of targeted potential customers and TQM does help you in positioning your uh, business that it does. If you look at uh, the elements of TQM, again there are many different elements and you can read them, you can see what they are, there are no real surprises there. This theme of continuous improvement, this is very important for the Japanese. They would do the same thing again and again and every time they do it, they come up with a slight improvement, they come up with a slight improvement. It is not like they are looking for a breakthrough, they are waiting for a breakthrough, which is the western style. The eastern style or the Japanese style is try to do some improvement every day, to the extent possible make an impact on your process. 
and uh, the philosophy of making each worker responsible for the quality of work that is also very very important. Let me give you the example of couple of cases in which I was involved. <coughs> there is an organization called BHEL, it is a very very famous company and the uh, letter stand for Bharat Heavy Electricals Limited. What is their business? They produce power supply equipment, they produce the uh, turbines, the steam turbines or the hydro turbines, they also produce the generators and eventually they produce a total facility that can produce 250 megawatts of power or 500 megawatts of power. These are world scale generators of power, they are in this business. The example is as follows, I go around and I give talks on quality in various different places and on one of those occasions I was invited to go to BHL in a town called Hardwar. It's a very very pretty place and the Ganges you know it is rushing down from the mountains and it is just reaching the plains and water speed is very very fast. And on the shores of this uh, river there, there is this huge plant, the BHL plant where they fabricate all these uh, different turbines and so on and so forth. Now I was there to give a talk and after some gap, I had some time, I had about an hour, about an hour and I wanted to walk around and I asked people could I go to the uh, shop floor. Lo and behold in a few minutes I was in the shop floor and they had these different machines and all kinds of machining was going on and different things were going on, welding and uh, you know machining and grinding and so on, all that was taking place at these workstations. I found a gentleman, he was about uh, 35 and I walk up to him and I look at him and he kind of looks like he's, he really knows what he's going on, he seems to have, he seemed to have good experience and his hand, in his hand he had a turbine blade, he had a turbine blade in his hand which had been forged by another system and now he was doing the grinding on it, he was trying to make sure he gave it the shape because it had to be aerodynamic and so on to make sure it functioned pretty well and it was able to convert the steam's energy, the pressure into rotation and with that the shaft is going to rotate and so on, all that would happen if the blades were ok. And he was grinding these individual blades, he was machining them. Now that was something he was doing one blade after the other, so you take one blade, you do the job and then you do something, you do some, you make some measurements, you write something down, then you pick up the next blade and you do the same thing, you do again some grinding and so on, then you make some very very specific measurements, then take a look at it, make some corrections and again you would make some measurements and so on. While he was doing that, he was writing down a lot of stuff. So I found him writing down in you know, a measurement A, B, C, D and he was measuring these things and there was a picture, there was a picture of the uh, turbine blade and the blade was somehow like this and it would make these measurements at various spots and it would write down some numbers there, 12, 14 or 12 and 8 and 6 and 2 there and so on and so forth. He was doing this. As he was preparing these blades, he had that picture there and he was writing these things. And I kind of you know, a bit to tease him and a bit to find out really what was going on. He asked him uh, in, in, in Hindi we call such people Ustad, so I said Ustad ji what the hell are you doing? I did not say hell of course, I said uh, what in heaven are you doing? And he said uh, well I am making turbine blades, it is a very important part that goes into a huge turbine and what we have to make sure is that the turbines are made properly and that means the blades have to be made properly. So my job is to produce these blades, I said well I see that. I see you have got this diagram you make and you are making these measurements, then you are writing certain things down, you are filling up some charts, it looks like he had some charts there and he was doing this kind of stuff, he was doing that as the blades were coming out. And I said, uh, sir please tell me why are you bothered about these uh, uh, preparing the chart and so on and so forth, your job is to basically fabricate that, uh, that turbine blade, so basically you would be really worried about the turbine blade. Why is it that you are writing all these numbers down, making all these measurements? What is the use of all this? You are a machinist, you have got so many years of experience, probably 12, 14 years of experience, you should be focusing on machining. This seems like clerical work, why are you doing this? This is the philosophy of making each worker responsible for what he is doing and let me show you what happened, let me tell you what happened. He really, he gave me a very stern look. 
And then he asked me, Sir, do you mind telling me who you are? I got a little uh, sort of a somewhat shaken up. I said, well, you know, I'm a teacher and I've been brought here to uh, give some talks and so on. And I had some time, so I came down to the floor and found you are doing some interesting things. So I want to chat with you a little bit. But I'm still very curious, you know, why are you bothered with all these, writing all these numbers down and plotting these charts? Why are you concerned with that? He said, sir, let me tell you something. If this turbine blade that I'm making, if the dimensions are not right at the right places, and suppose this turbine blade malfunctions in the big turbine where it is put in. There are like 50, 60 such blades, they will be put around the hub and then the turbine, when the steam comes, it will start rotating. And suppose it is not balanced, suppose something is wrong with it. The turbine may basically fail and that means the generator that is connected with it with a big shaft, it is also going to fail. That means it is not going to be generating power anymore. That means whichever power station is using this, and through the electric grid, suppose it supplies power to Delhi and in Delhi you have got all these parliaments and everything else and marketplace and factories and so on outside Delhi, they are going to shut down. So, because of my poor work, it is very possible that Delhi is going to collapse or Delhi is going to have a power out for maybe 6 hours or 10 hours or God knows how long. That is the reason I have to do this job, right? I have to make these measurements. These are to be looked at by an engineer. He is going to make sure in the evening after he goes through all these charts that things are acceptable. As far as business is concerned, things are acceptable to me. You know, I honestly was more than impressed. I could not believe that this man knew the value of his work. He knew it to the point he knew exactly the impact of his not doing the job right and its impact, you know, some, some hundreds of miles away on Delhi or perhaps some other place. He knew that very, very clearly. This is one example. Let me show you the, let me talk about the other example, a parachute factory. This parachute factory is also located in the north and uh, there of course, we have a different kind of story to tell you. Again, like I visited BHEL, I went to this parachute factory and this factory produced parachutes and these parachutes were used by these uh, amateurs, you know, the uh, people whose hobby is to uh, fly uh, parachute, jump off some cliff and float around and so on. These parachutes, they were fabricated in this parachute factory. And I walk up to a particular place and a workstation there again, because my talk was over and I had some time to float around. So, I went down to the shop floor and I found they had uh, what looked like a bunch of tailors. Tailors means they were, you know, cutting up sheets of plastic and sheets of silk and sheets of cloth they are stitching them, stitching them here, stitching them there and so on, they are doing this. There was one gentleman, there was one gentleman, he was actually cutting the cloth. He had a template in front of him and he was cutting this cloth. First of all, I should tell you, in the North India, there are not many places where people use parachute. It is all used either in the hills, which is really up north or they are done in the south. Some places again, where there are uh, recreational facilities and people you know, they, 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 they take a jump either from an airplane or uh, from a hill and they float around and they have some fun that way. Around the area where this factory was located, there were no parachute jumpers there. Now, you walk up to this gentleman and he has got this huge sheet of uh, cloth laid out in front of him and he had this template also laid out in front of him and his, the template was there like this. And you would spread the cloth on top of this, so the cloth would be spread. And then you take his scissor and you start cutting, 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 cutting. And it cut, 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 cut. And it discard this part and it keep the cloth. This you would then fold up and it stack them up someplace. Then I asked him, what do you do now? I said, well, you know, I am not concerned with that. I basically produce these these uh, triangles and I ship them over to the next department. They have a box and I go and pile them up in that box and then they do something with it. I said, sir, what is it that is actually happening here? What are you trying to do? And he said, well, uh, in my language, it is called chhatri. We are making chhatris. We are producing chhatris. Chhatris are kind of the uh, colloquial word for a parachute. 
that's got a circular shape and it's got a canopy and so on and so forth and there's strings and of course the man who is jumping he's hanging by the parachute he's got some strings attached with his body to the parachute to the cloth there and this man's job was to prepare these uh, triangular sheets and these would be then stitched up and the canopy would be prepared and so on i asked him sir have you seen someone jump off an airplane have you actually seen the chhatri open up have you actually seen it yourself and he said no sir i have never seen it. i said what about uh, maybe uh, some other place have you actually you know that chhatris are used by uh, he said yeah yeah sir i know i know they are used by people and i've i've heard they are used by young people they kind of you know they have some fun and they do this i said what about you have you actually if you, you so you are telling me you have never really seen a real real parachute open up and the man floating down you've never seen that yourself right he said no sir just think of this person who is doing this his sensitivity toward the user he has no idea who the user is or what he does how he jumps how the parachute opens up i'm sure he is probably curious but he had never had that opportunity to interface with a person like that well this was not so bad let me tell you what happened after this after this little visit to the uh, shop floor i had an occasion to have some tea with some people these were the supervisors and these were graduates they were graduate engineers who were supervisors of these people they were in charge of various shops somebody was in charge of the belt department somebody was in charge of cutting department so was in charge of something else and so was in charge of stitching and so on these guys they were supervisors they were at much higher level than these people there and they were having tea with me we were sitting around the table they were chatting about various things life in the factory life in this and so on but i uh, the the general manager was also there he happened to be there and i again i just wanted to ask the same question i actually asked a uh, gentleman you've been here a few years 3 uh, 4 5 years you're probably waiting for your promotion so you can go on to better jobs and bigger jobs but tell me have you actually seen someone jump off an airplane have you actually seen your parachutes utilized by somebody and this is a city in the north again in the plains so again there is no real local no opportunity to watch these parachutes float around in the uh, in the sky there is no such opportunity there none of these people had been exposed to that they had been exposed to a, a site where they could really see a fellow jump off a cliff for a parachute with a parachute and the parachute open up and slowly come down to the ground they had not seen it themselves they are young engineers they are supervisors there's one person who said yes sir i have seen uh, a fellow jump off a parachute i said well how is it how is it that your experience is so different from these people they they also seem to be you know looking about the same and so on they can't be much uh, younger to you how is it that you know about parachute he said sir i uh, i was really originally i was selected by the air force but then i for some reason i got hurt somewhere so i was uh, asked to go into civilian duty so i have been assigned to this factory and i work here this was the only person who had physically seen a parachute a parachute in use unless you have seen how the user is going to be using this object suppose i am the producer of this object if i have never been exposed to the person and never come face to face with the person who is the real user do you really think i'll do a top job in producing this so the contrasting pictures are this the first one is the turbine where the man knew fully well the consequence of his work or the consequence of doing a poor job there and the fellow who was cutting these uh, you know pieces of cloth in a parachute factory this fellow had no idea at all as far as the end user was concerned so would he be sensitive this is something that is very very important and this is what is saying making each worker responsible for the quality of his or her work and that will not come by pounding on his head it will not come by pounding on his head by by some just some philosophy it will come only with a direct face to face contact so you need things like the qfd and so on to come in direct contact with the user unless you do that you just will never have that sensitivity the ladies when they serve you food what do they do they watch your face what they have produced how do you like it your face will tell them without even saying oh food is outstanding food is knockout blah blah these things 
they will watch your face. Some gentleman who has preserved this special wine that he brought from France for you, he has got that bottle there and he pulls out that bottle and he lays it, he shows off, he says you know look at this you know chateau some wine there. This I have kept, I was waiting for your visit and now that you are there and when he pours it out and gives it to you in a little goblet and he starts sipping, what does he do? He watches your face and there he is coming in direct contact, face to face contact with the user and, uh, and he gets signals from it. He probably finds out well this Indian guy who is from the east, he loves fish but he probably does not like my wine and probably next time I should not be serving him this, I should be serving him something else. This is something, this is a sensitivity that you require and this comes only when you got face to face contact with it. So, no matter what you do in terms of your logic, philosophy and everything else, you cannot forget the customers. You cannot expect to win if you forget the customers, that is very, very important. There are obviously some classical ways to solve problems and you have got the definition of the problem, you collect data, you analyze things and you do, uh, you generate potential solutions, you choose a solution then you implement the solution and you solve, but these are classical problem solving steps. This is somewhat different from what basically Deming ended up saying. Deming said you plan what you are going to do some corrective action you are going to take, you carry it out, you look at the effect and then you act which is like take the next step to come around. This is his PDCA cycle, this plan do, study or check and act PDSA or PDCA cycle. This was given by Edward Deming, he gave this. Process improvement obviously could proceed this way and a lot of processes they are basically worked at by this way. But in fact, there are more powerful methods. So, refinements have been produced of this PDCA cycle. This is one example and you can pause the tape, you can pause your screen and you can take a look at these things, you can read them and see what they are. Not very different from what we saw in PDCA except some refinements have been done. But Six Sigma provides you a much more powerful framework and that framework is spelled DMAIC. DMAC. This I am going to get into a little bit to give you a little glimpse of how Six Sigma is different. But before that, let me just remind you Six Sigma does not throw away TQM, Six Sigma builds on TQM. So, we will catch a glimpse of some of the tools of TQM. If you have not used them, believe me, try to use them, try to use some of these TQM tools and you will find how useful they are. Just this morning, there was an occasion one student came to me. And he told me, sir, teachers are late coming to the class. Just think of this problem. This kid is highly conscientious. He is really strongly motivated to learn. And he comes to the class and he finds the teacher is not there. He is trying to get into the building and he is finding that the class could not be started because of variety of different things. And he says, sir, this is something I would like to analyze, I would like to understand. Then he and I, we went to an empty class. And I drew a cause and effect diagram. I am going to give you some examples of that. I will go there gradually. So, we will call that process improvement. So, we are going to be looking at some process improvement tools. There are a number of tools available. As I get to that point, I am going to pause for a minute. I am going to bring up this issue of teachers coming late to the class. How did we tackle that? The basic, basic TQM tools include flowcharts, check sheets, histograms, Pareto charts, scatter diagrams, control charts, cause and effect diagrams and run charts. They are probably listing more than 7 tools here because some of these are quite similar. What we have to remember is that each has a specific purpose. For example, the control chart is used to control a process and the run chart is basically, the run chart is not probably marked here. The run chart is used basically to keep track how many run chart is right at the bottom here to keep track of how many items produced are out of specification. So, control charts have a different function. They try to help you control a process to keep accuracy in control and to keep precision in control, two objectives. And what does the run chart do? It just tries to make sure your production is within specification. That is what the run chart will do. 
So, there are different applications. So, a process is there, there is input going on and all these different factors they might be impacting your process. So, your sources of variation, variation is something that we do not like. For example, we saw our friendly chart which was like this one and with the black distribution you saw a lot of variation that people would not like and somehow we got it to the green distribution that has smaller variation. This is something customers would also like because everything is fitting within the spec limits. This how does this variation occur? It occurs because of all these different factors they are not always in control. All these different factors they are not always in control that is why we end up with variation. So, variation is something that nobody likes, nobody likes variation and in particular quality assurance people or quality managers they should literally go mad when they see variation. They should go mad and they should try to fix it. What are some of the tools? One way is to try to flow chart the process, go from the beginning to the end, trace the process and try to locate those spots where quality seems to be out of whack, out of control. Then you focus there and you would try to take some steps just before that to try to make sure again the process comes within control. And there is this run chart of course and I have given you the results of it and it can be used to identify when equipment or process they are not behaving according to specification. So, this is really it has got spec limits here not control limits, it has got spec limits here that is what it is trying to do. Then of course, you have got this little data collection chart called the checklist. These are all TQM tools. Then you got something called the histogram, which gives you a picture of the history of production. And if on top of this, suppose suppose I am able to superimpose specification limits, then I can find out you know what are the parts that are out of specs, and which are the parts, what is the fraction of parts that is within specification. That's something that I could do quite easily with the histogram. When it comes to root cause analysis, the best tool for that is the cause and effect diagram and the cause and effect diagram has the effect written on the right hand side and the various causes initially they are developed by doing speculation. You do not try to solve the problem directly with the cause and effect diagram, but first you try to speculate what are the different causes that might have caused this and I am going to go back that teacher coming late to the class problem in just couple of minutes. Let us take a look at one finished cause and effect diagram. This is like one that is under construction and this is the one that has been completed. So, it has got many more details. Let me tell you now what happened in that uh, class teacher coming to the class situation. We went to this empty classroom and we wrote down the effect to the right. We said teacher comes late to the class and I drew the spine of the fish, teacher late. And this could be caused by a variety of different things. And the student, of course, did not want to be uh, kind of put on the spot. He did not want to really come up with the factors himself. He knew many factors, but he did not want because I was a teacher, I am a teacher, he did not want to sound like offensive. So, he held back a little bit. Then I had to provoke him a little bit. I had to provoke him a little bit. So, I started out by saying, Well, the teacher is late, maybe because the building is locked. Could this happen? He said, sir, yes. Uh, what about rain? Rain and flood? Could that also prevent this teacher to come? Rain and flood? He said, yes. Then we started saying, what about other factors? Is it possible that he woke up late? So, he woke up late, alarm did not go off. Uh, and I acknowledge that. And he, we went on and on like this and believe me, we found reasons that were really strange. For example, yes, indeed the building was locked and the phone was not working and so on. And would you believe the teacher did not know the time of the class? Because when we called up the teacher, he said, well, some students called, I did not really know the right time of the class. And I said, till it is confirmed that the time is right, how could I start the class? Because maybe other people were missing the class. So, I did not do the class and so on. So, this is like how you slowly do what we call root cause analysis, then you start removing them. For example, if you found that the gate, gatekeeper, the steward does not show up on time, the fellow is supposed to open the gate 
open the doors, he does not show up on time. The class is supposed to start at 7.30 a.m. in IIT Kharagpur. This is our routine. And suppose the man with the key does not show up till after 8 perhaps, because that is his routine. But he does not quite know that once he opens the door, only then people can get in. So, that had to be fixed. So, this problem had to be fixed by in fact telling him what the time was for opening the thing. Rain and flood he could not probably do much about, but perhaps the access to the building could be controlled. If there is a huge puddle there, probably one could not walk through that and so on and so forth. So, basically this is how you do it. What about waking up? If this is something where the teacher has to change his habits, let it be known to him. But will you really start beating him up? Will you really start calling this teacher? Will you really start sending him emails? What you have to count on is how frequently, how often does this happen? If it happened like once a year or twice a year, that is okay. Everybody understand. But is this happening like three times in a week? Then of course, something is wrong. Maybe he is going to bed too late. Maybe his PhD student keeping him, is keeping him up in his office till maybe 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock and then of course, he is going to be late coming up, coming up. And this I have personally experienced this thing some, sometimes when students really stay with you for a very late hour, you know, till very late hours. And of course, you are then kind of wondering, you know, what should I do? Should I ask him to go or should I just complete this discussion? It becomes kind of a little dilemma. So, in any case, the issue is this. If you have to find the root cause for an issue that is there, a quality problem that is there, you got to be able to construct this. Initially, this is done on a speculative basis. As you see in this, in this uh, chart, that is the finished chart on the screen here. This is a finished chart. Uh, then you start examining them. This is only one use of this control chart uh, of this uh, fishbone diagram. The other use is if you've got definitive factors here, factors A, B, C, D, and so on. And if these are control variables, if these are factors that you can control, you could take them high, you could set them at the middle, or you could push them down to a low setting. You will have to find out what is the right setting for this. And the technique for doing that, can you tell me what that technique is? I think some of you would remember, it is DOE, design of experiment. And design of experiments also is the, is right at the core of six sigma. So, it turns out that the cause and effect diagram is the beginning of a six sigma project. I have done it personally. Nobody gave me the factors. Nobody told me, Professor, Professor Bhakchi, here are the factors. And just please play with those factors. I had to make sure that none of the important factors were left out of this list. For that, I had to get back to the cause and effect diagram. I really had to get down to this. I had to make sure all the important factors are captured. Then we would, you know, construct a matrix and we'll start doing our experiment. So it's a very, very important tool. I just can't tell you how important some of these tools are, even in a large project like the six sigma project. Then of course, you have got SPC and SPC comes along, not, not exactly at the start of your six sigma project, but in the control stage, D M A I C. So, at that C point, when you want to stabilize the process, in order to keep it that way, use SPC to monitor the process. And what is the result for doing all this? If you start with the process, look at the, look at the distribution on the left hand side, it is wide. That means, perhaps my product is probably out of specification occasionally. I should just remind you that here I have got control limits. I do not have spec limits because what I am plotting here is some variable like x bar or r, which are really statistical in nature. These are not individual measurement. Then of course, after some work, after some troubleshooting, I am able to narrow down the variability. So, variability is maximum at this end, it is medium here and it is narrowest here. Hopefully, more customers, more customers are going to be satisfied at this level. This is something I have got to remember. This is like one tool. How do I get ideas? Well, the best way to get ideas is by brainstorming. And there are those rules. If you have any doubt, pick up some books that discuss brainstorming and look through the chapter or go on internet and just type uh, brainstorming and just see what comes out. You will get many, many people who are writing on this brainstorming. You will find many articles on it, perhaps even white papers and you just read them. It is not that difficult to basically learn about. It is somewhat difficult to control yourself when you are in a brainstorming session, because we tend to speak up and we tend to control others. 
quality circles is the same way interviewing is like another way to generate ideas benchmark is a great way and the japanese method for 5 watts and 2 hows that's like another method by which you could do that quality circle i'm just going to be you know basically displaying these uh, uh, these uh, screens here for you these uh, slides here quality circle is a team approach of course it's a made up of volunteers and so on and it works very well unfortunately in the eastern cultures it does not work so well in the west because tend to be more people tend to be more individualistic that's why it does not seem to work there generating ideas of course brainstorming is a great way and uh, this is like something that you should really practice and you should really see how a good person does that benchmark is a great way to find out how other people are doing the same thing but they are doing it better you basically you just have to go there and observe what they are doing so for example let's say you want to improve your study habits or you want to come up with uh, you know with high grades in your class as an example somehow find a person who is better than you and observe how he spends his whole day find out what all different activities does he involve in in survey mean yes his iq may be different from yours but what about all the other stuff that he does perhaps when he leaves the class he goes to an isolated area and he glances through the notes perhaps he takes a pen and he marks all those things that he needs to get clarification on perhaps when he comes to the class he sits right at the front bench and he's always interacting with the with the teacher to try to find out what is going on perhaps he tries all the problems that have been assigned to him perhaps he cross checks the answers with other people perhaps he works in a group so find out what all things he is doing and find out things that you are not doing this is the way to benchmark yourself his benchmark is here and you are here and you have to rise up to that level this is also done by industry many industry institutions organizations they encourage benchmarking because they want to be competitive not so much competing with each other because people may come from different areas for example here i've got american Ex express they have a way to get customers to pay up quickly and many people many companies have a real great difficulty in getting people to pay on time disney world look at employee commitment and every time i have visited the disney world or the disneyland i've been amazed by the dedication people have there these are the workers they probably do not get a get a lot of money they don't their pay is probably not very different from other places but somehow the the organization it's been able to inspire them in a way they feel they are there only to provide the service to entertain people that's what and it shows on their face it shows in their action federal express for its speed it is considered to be a benchmark mcdonald for its consistency whether it's tokyo whether it is delhi or it's new york or any place you go to mcdonald you order something you order a fish burger it will have the same taste the tartar sauce will have exactly the same you know tangy feeling and so on and so forth it's so consistent it's just amazing you would not even know where it came from xerox for its benchmarking method if you just want to learn about benchmarking look at what xerox does that's like a great way to do that so there are some details on benchmarking process and i'm going to be flipping through them and you can pause if you want you can read through them and you can find out exactly how this is done so this is going to be basically a couple of slides are there to summarize what all things are there in terms of the tools and their utility these are all tkm tools they are all utilized in uh, in um, eventually going your six signal projects your suppliers can also give you good ideas that also comes along something you got to keep in mind is that in any of these things whether you are drawing control charts you are doing design of experiments or any of these things you are making some measurements you got to make sure your instruments are proper and there are two things there are two very important things in regard to instruments the first one of course is that the instruments have to be accurate this is something very very important instruments have to be accurate so accuracy is something that's very important when you're using an instrument and the second thing is the precision also has to be good and let me define these terms for you very very quickly accuracy basically says how close your average is to the target so let's say my average is x bar how close is it to the target tau 
the closer it is the more accurate your system is. So, if you are looking at an instrument for example, if you are looking at these gauges which are on the screen here, you have to take a standard object and you know its true dimension. Then you take some readings with these instruments and you look at the average quantity. If that average turns out to be close to the target which is the true value, your instrument is accurate. What about precision? What is that dimension? If I take multiple readings x 1, x 2, x 3, x 4, are they kind of you know scattered around a wide space? Are they scattered here, 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 here? They are scattered over a wide area. If it is like this, then precision is lacking. But if the measurements, individual measurements of the same object, if they turn out to be close to each other, like this, I have precision, I have good precision. So, it is the spread of repeated measurements that will indicate to you how precise that instrument is. And these are two things that are also very important in process control. When it comes to accuracy, we want to make sure our processes they stay in control, they are accurate and also they are precise. To try to make sure that a process is accurate, we use the x bar chart the x bar control chart. And to try to make sure my precision is there, I use what is called the range chart or the R chart. The R chart will make sure that you are able to get precision in your in the delivery on the output side of the process, which I will discuss again when I get to SPC, I am going to be discussing these again. You just be aware of it. So, instruments have to be right and there are certain things that are called gauge R and R study. You know, the the the, the uh, fineness with which you can make measurements, your calibration should be right. Calibration by the way, it helps you make an inaccurate instrument still provide you measurements that you can take to be corrected calibrated readings. And if the instrument has been calibrated, you know that a certain reading is equal to a true reading of this value that is done by the calibration plot. So, this is something you got to keep in mind and this is something kindly taken in, take into consideration whenever you are using an instrument. Please go through the records of the instrument and try to find out it has been calibrated using some standard methods. Then of course, if variation is there in the thing, then your precision could be impacted and for that you have to do some studies and you may have to run some special, special tests, special experiments to get an idea of how precise that instrument is or how poor that precision is. And this whole area is called gauge R and R. If you are collecting some data, part of that data could be because of the parts that you are using and part of it due to measurement errors. Part of that data, the variance that you see in the in the actual data, the, the numbers that you have collected that have come out of the instrument readings, those could be due to the true parts and that those, those true variations could be because of the different parts you are using. These different parts where they are produced at different times, there may be some natural variation you know their, their heights are different, their thickness is different and so on. That is the natural variation, there is a part to part variation. But if I am using an instrument to measure their height, then the instrument also itself can introduce some variation. So, there are two parts of it, there is the parts variation and then there is the measurement variation. It is very important for us to make sure measurement variations are as small as possible. And most of the variation that I see in the data is really due to parts variation, because that is what I am after. I could not be bothered about the performance of the instrument. I really want to make sure the data that I see is reflecting the true part to part variation. That is what I would like to see. For that you have to do this gauge RNR study and some special methods are there. I will just mention this word to you gauge RNR. So, wherever you are, you please try to make sure people have done a gauge RNR study before you go into your TQM application, before you go into your control charts, before you go into your six acre projects. Please make sure the gauge RNR studies have been done, only then you start your six second project. This is like taking care of your ground keeping, basically your, your housekeeping. So, measurement errors actually they themselves could be caused by people or they could be caused by instruments. If there are, there are different technicians, we say if different technicians are producing different readings, the measurement system has a reproduce reproduction problem. And if the same instrument produces different readings in the hands of the same individual, then there is a repeatability problem. And these again have to be understood and you got to make sure that this total measurement error again is quite low. 
and normally speaking in industry people say measurement error should not be more than 10 percent of what you are trying to measure. That is just like a rule of thumb that is all it may not be good enough for you, but that is something that we will have to do. Then of course, is this issue of external benchmarking that is like you take your work workers to another company. For example, if there is one particular company that produces electronic parts like you know inside mobile phones there are these little printer circuit boards on which they have got the transistors mounted and the resistors mounted and coils mounted and so on. Sometimes that soldering is not quite good and you have some defects in the instrument or the instrument stops. For example, even a little mouse here inside there are some soldered parts and uh, if the soldering has not been done very well you may have difficulty in using the instruments for example. In the old days the PCs used to be that way. Many of those they came out hand assembled parts and they did not really behave very well. The issue was this how do you produce well good you know properly soldered printed circuit board. A machine came along which is called a wave soldering machine and this really lets the PCB imagine the PCB floating on this the, the little wave of molten solder and the PCB floats on it when it comes in contact with the molten solder it picks up it picks up the solder and the joints they become properly properly tinned and so on and the solder is perfect. Now, this is all fine if my machine is controlled very well this is a process machine and I am floating I am basically floating these parts from one end to the other and there is a heating stage there is a warming stage and so on then I insert the parts and so on and then I bring them over this thing then I cool them off and so on. This is the process with different stages if this process is not controlled well you may not work with you may not get get proper outputs. There was one company where they were using this wave soldering system to produce their parts and they had converted on to this wave soldering system because they got tired with their manual soldering. They had all these you know the soldering guns and it was hanging by a by a cord and the worker would go there and you would solder this then you would solder this then solder this and so on that is how he was doing his assembly and they found this was highly labor intensive. So, their intention, intention was to produce good parts and also make sure they could cut back on labor requirement. So, they installed this gigantic wave soldering machine after six months of operation they could not really produce good parts with this new system they could not do it. In fact, they had to bring all those people that they had laid off back in the shop again and their job was to take these parts these uh, parts that were not really behaving very well and touch them up here and there and so on touch them up so that they could be put into the uh, real machines inside maybe uh, mobiles or whatever they were they were they were supposed to go inside and they were really frustrated and again I got called in and I was told could I help them in certain ways and I looked at their system I said uh, well it looks like a lot of things really are have not been aligned properly. So, you have to do some study and do it and the manager like most managers he was very impatient he said well professor I do not have that much time I have already spent six months and I think I have done all the training that I could and still we do not get good parts what do we do what do you think we should do. Our professor obviously took some time in uh, two three days uh, once I was brushing my teeth early in the morning and I got this idea maybe what I could do is I could load up these guys these uh, workers and couple of supervisors in a mini mini bus and I could take them to a place where they had a properly functioning wave soldering system and I would let these guys just watch do not ask any question nothing at all just watch watch this system in operation they had their own system in their home in their home base which is their factory where they work and they would be taken to this new place the other factory and they were just they were just allowed to watch basically what is going on because obviously the other company did not want to share a lot of tricks with them but they could really you know like people come to for sightseeing and so on they could probably have these people come and take a look and so on. Later on of course, I got them to talk to each other also but that was because I knew people personally at both ends I knew people. So, I could bring those people together and I got them to have coffee together and so on and that turned out to be a really successful project a benchmarking project. But what happened was when I brought this team of workers who were really bad performers poor performers in the eyes of their management and that were operating this uh, poorly functioning wave soldering machine I brought them to this other company where they had a properly functioning system there. 
these people watched the system for about half an hour. They were totally silent and they watched it some more. After about one hour, they started watching some of the, a bit more carefully what exactly was going on in the shop. They found a lot of dials, a lot of controls, a lot of this, a lot of that. And these were not there in their own system. They were not there. They had like a temperature gauge, they had a speed indicator, they had something else and so on. All these things were there. They had a video camera somewhere. And otherwise the system was the same that they had back in their own home. They had the same system. But these people, they had many more other things that were almost like monitoring this thing. Particularly there were some gauges, speed gauge, temperature gauge and so on, they were there. And occasionally they found, you know, that little, uh, the, the, the wave was there, wave of molten solder. Some fellow went and took some samples out of it. He put a little, you know, uh, a little thing and he dipped a little bit of it and he took it out and he did something with it. Then he came back, took another little thing. He was taking samples. Basically, he was trying to find out was this getting oxidized? Was the, was the, was the tin getting oxidized? Or was it still okay for, you know, some more run, another hour or run and so on? These people, the visitors, they observed this very carefully. I actually asked them at that point in time, are you finding anything new here? And you've looked at the system and so on and so forth. Are you finding anything new there? I said, Professor, we can't tell you how grateful we are. I said, tell me, what did you see? He said, first of all, it seems like there is some, some relationship between speed and temperature and all these things. We don't know that. Our manager says, produce, produce, produce. So we run it as fast as we can. Now, I do not know, I personally do not know if any of you have, uh, when you're young, if you tried your hand at the soldering gun. I don't know if you've done that. You have to give it a certain time to warm up. If you have to give it a certain time for the bead to become shiny, the, the bin of the, the uh, tin or the lead to become shiny, you have to give it some time to hold it there till the junction actually takes place. Then of course, you can let it cool. A lot of things have to happen correctly. So, the master solder people, they really know this thing very well. And none of this actually had been optimized in the system that these guys had installed. So they said, Professor, there are so many things we have to do. Can we just make a note of at what speed they are running and blah, blah, and those things? I said, I don't have that permission today. I'll try to get that. And perhaps you should, you guys should go back and try to pull out the technical manual that you have dumped. You have a similar machine, so you must have a technical manual with it. So, pull it out and just see what it says and compare that to your own running conditions. How did this happen? How did all this happen? It happened by benchmarking. It happened by benchmarking. This is like something that uh, is, uh, I will say, it just opens people's eyes. You don't have to do any training at all. They are smart. They can see. It's like you watching your buddy who is getting A after A after A in every exam and you're not doing so. Maybe you're goofing off a little bit, too much. Maybe you're spending more time at the tea shop or something. Maybe you're staying up too late and you're too groggy in the class when you come in the morning. Maybe you're like, uh, you're going like this in the class. You can't really concentrate. You can't really pick up much. If those things are happening, watch out. You're a prime candidate for benchmarking and you can improve. If you keep your eyes open, if your ears open, and if you go there with an open mind, I'm there to learn, I'm there to see and observe and make some notes, you'll end up picking up a lot of trips, a lot of tricks and these are shortcuts. You don't have to try this and try that and then get to the right spot. You'll not have to wake up at 5 a.m. do start your studies, 6 a.m. start your studies, 7 a.m. study studies and see at which hour if I wake up I get maximum marks in my quiz. Maybe it is 6.5 or something. You don't have to do that. Just watch that other fellow. He's similar to you in most respects. He's similar to you. The Japanese obviously have other methods like the Shingo method and then there's the Pokeyok method which is like you see a lot of these things when you look at electrical points, for example. I'll try to see if I could find a, there's a plug point there on the wall. You can't probably see it because it's outside the range of the camera. But many times, if you look at the sockets and if you look at the uh, holes in the plug, they have used some bit of poker yoke so that a 5 amp, 5 amp plug will not go into a 15 amp plug, 15, 15 amp socket. It just won't because they've applied some bit of poker yoke. 
because people made those mistakes. I remember in the early days when the connections were difficult to find, the telephone wallets, you know, the guys who fix telephones in your homes, they use the same plug to, you know, basically take a two, two, two prong plug and that is used by, uh, you know, electric lamp type of people and they use the same plug for telephones also. So, I have physically seen a lady, you know, quickly pick up a telephone and plug it into a wall plug which has the electricity and set a little fire there. Luckily, she was safe, but this I have seen with my own eyes because the plugs looked exactly the same. There is no difference. That is not pokeyuk. Pokeyuk is when the plug shapes are different and plug sizes are different and so on. This is like something by which the Japanese produce a lot of good quality products. So, there are in the end when you look at service quality, the moment of truth is when you directly come in contact with the customer face to face. Lot of things happen then. There is a lot of interaction and at some point in time people say you get the message. Why is it that we call something service driven? Because we look at tangible things that the customer is looking for, we look at convenience, we look at reliability if it comes back again does he see the same thing, responsiveness, time and so on. This is like one whole area and there are slides here that are about service quality and service quality has obviously a lot of these things. If it is like a hotel for example, you will see, you will see facilities that are clean, convenience is something that you would like to see, a lot of convenience is shown there. Reliability is also again something that you would like to see, responsiveness and you can read them, you can really see and you will probably agree with them that these are all vital when it comes to providing service. I should tell you about uh, one or two of these things. For example, uh, in a surprise that I got when I went to a French hotel, this was in near Montreal. I walk in there and I, as I was getting off the taxi, uh, there is this bellboy, he walked up and he said bonjour, bonjour, I said bonjour, nice, nice, good, wonderful and so on and he just asked me a very simple question, sir have you been here before? And I said yes, uh, I have been here before, I have stayed here before, but it was quite some time back, about a couple of years back I was here, that is all. Then I walk up to the counter and the young lady is there and she looks at me, she gives a wonderful smile and she also says, oh it is wonderful to see you sir you are back again, it is wonderful. I was really surprised, I was shocked. I had never met this lady, I could never remember that I had met this lady. How was she, she saying this? You know what happened? The bell boy, because he asked me that question, sir, have you been here before? He was standing behind me, he was with my bag and his hand went like this. I of course, could not see that he was doing that behind me and the lady picked up the signal from there. This is an old customer and you are specially courteous to me and I felt like I was wanted here and I stayed there one extra night. So, they got some more business out of me because I felt this is the difference of quality service. This is approaching Six Sigma. I will continue with the theme as we move into this, I will continue with the theme. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.